All set? Okay. Uh, today we're talking about discussion forums, I guess, and implementing them, because you're probably getting just about to that point where you're uh, getting them working and uh, wondering how to make them efficient. So uh, I guess we can talk about user experience. Um, in the old RS Digital Community System, we had a couple user experiences. This was our first idea, which was to have question, answer, possible other answers all underneath. So here's, you know, when will virtual reality arrive to the net? Here's three answers from different people. And if there were a response to one of these responses, it would sort in underneath. So that's not a bad little system. However, we eventually chucked it in favor of Q and A, in which we present the same data from the same tables, but we just query out the question and then all the responses and put them on together on one page. And we decided that this was actually a better user interface. This one really hails uh, from the old Usenet clients, the old NetNews clients that we were familiar with. So this is our first idea about threaded discussion. We eventually concluded that the threads weren't really buying us anything, that actually for most people, threads were the wrong thing. And I think Microsoft actually has figured this out too. They had their sociologists on staff at Microsoft Research, and they concluded that if there's a really big, complicated thread, it's almost always just people flaming at each other. And uh, there's nothing interesting happening there. And in fact, one way to get rid of bad users is to just look at people who participate in really long threads and nuke them. Um, so uh, yeah, generally, a productive thread on any kind of uh, online learning community will have a question and a few answers, um, not you know people answering each other's answers and criticizing specific points. So the mechanics of threading, now in this case, of course, this forum has always been served through the machinery of Q&A forum, not through threading. So you know, when you do a post a response, the software is always posting a response to the main, um, to the main thread, uh, to the original question, and therefore you're never going to see the software showing off its threaded roots here. So those are two styles on ACS. Um, there's also, I think I showed you this earlier, community.cnn.com. <sighs> Peace in the Balkans. Yeah, so here's, um, um, anyway, a lot of flaming going on, and you can go, I guess, if you go to next, the interesting thing is if you go to next, you get back exactly to the same place. You can just keep going next, next, next. And you keep going to the same place as where you started. Because you started, because you started the most recent. It's because you started the most recent. They're using the commercial packaged web crossing software, WebX, which is some little tiny company, I guess, that makes discussion message board software for people. Closed source software. They built their own database system so they could sell it to lots of people. So it runs out of its own little file system based database. Um, anyway, that's the UI. So you go to the main page, and then you go back. I guess you could go all the way to the original start of the discussion. Maybe it was more intelligent then. Old messages aren't categorized. So in the, say, photo.net forum, where you have a whole lot of questions like that, you get, by default, some number of 
reasonable, reasonably new questions. And after that, the moderators or the users have categorized their postings a bit. So I think this is more useful for getting access to the archive thoughts than scrolling through 42,000. So that's another approach to discussion form. Um, Slashdot, I guess you're all pretty well familiar with. Uh, I think Slashdot is closer to the photo.net style Q&A forum than it is to uh, a lot of other things. Although it has some extra features like nesting. You can show it all on the same page, but kind of nest the responses to the responses in. I think you also got to consider the sophistication of your users. So that Usenet style interface was very good when uh, you know users were extremely sophisticated and they all had invested some time to learn about net news and they all knew what net news was. Now, of course, 99% of the people using the photo.net Q&A forum have never heard of Usenet and they've never seen a news client. So it doesn't really make as much uh, as much sense. All right. Have you considered building one-line answers? Uh, you've got the concept of one line, but building one-line answers into the compendium of newly answered questions so that it's consolidated on one page with indentation to show I'm answering the um, like a compromise between your two ACS approaches. What do you mean? Like if there's a one-line answer, show it right here on the cover show page? Show all one-line answers. In, in the first ACS screen, the, the old-fashioned one. Oh, I see. The indented ones just say it's a response, but that's obvious from the indentation. The uh, nobody uses this interface anyway, so we've never bothered enhancing it. We don't use it. So it's open source. If you want to do that, go ahead. But you'll have to find some publisher who wants to run it, and I don't think you will. Because frames suck, and uh, threading is more complicated than most people want. Although Slashdot has found a community of really hardcore nerds that uh, you know get some utility out of full threading. I think for most online learning communities, you know, you can moderation though. Slashdot. They keep their threads. Yeah. Smiley. <laughs> so I think that you know, in an online learning community, you can assume that people aren't there just to waste their time and have a random discussion. They're actually there to learn, which means most things are questions, which means that you know most of the things that are responses are, in fact, responses to the questions, to the original question. Ideally, they're on topic, a response to a response. It can be made, and if, you're, if, you get, if you catch it quick enough in photo.net, you can make a response to a response just by posting it um, right after that, and then it'll sort by date right underneath. Um, if uh, you don't catch it fast enough, you know, you could say, well, I'm responding to, you know, what Walter says four messages up. So it's not ideal, but at least, you know, it is, it, the users do have a means of uh, that kind of collaboration if they want to. They just have to use natural language a little bit more. <coughs> All right, let's talk about the uh, simple data model for this. So we talked on Thursday a bit about how to basically build your whole system with uh, one table. This is getting to be like MIT. I guess here's a piece of chalk. More aware. Oh, yes. So we looked at data models last week. Or actually, it seems like last week. It was only Monday. All right, so a lot of people had, some people had, you know, a news table and a B board table. I don't know, and some other tables. They had a lot of tables, one for each little section on their site. Um, and sometimes they actually had, it was interesting, one group actually had sort of a content table, and these guys all pointed to that. So these are basically all helper tables adding extra columns to the content table, and they would always join them. So it was interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, they would picked the wrong names. This should have been called news underscore helper in that case, and just had the extra columns, or news extra columns. And then they should have created a view called news, which would have just joined these two and shown you all the columns you needed for a fully instantiated news object. If what you really want to do is create a table called news, it inherits its columns from content. I thought that would have the generic stuff. 
stuff. Content would have the stuff that's common, like who contributed it, when it was contributed, uh, one line, subject, body. I don't know. A news might have an expiration time or something, something you wouldn't, you know, maybe normally want in column. And B board would have some kind of refers to thing, and they had comments on static pages, and I guess they had articles also. So the second thing that was interesting is they were using Postgres. Uh, and they had a book. I guess it's not a very good book on Postgres. Uh, we like it. <laughs> this wasn't your data model, I don't think. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. It's it's only book on Postgres. <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> I thought it was a terrible book, actually. I mean, the one thing that I want out of documentation for a database, first and foremost, is what are the limits on data types? And it doesn't contain any of that information. So I thought it was, I was efficiently offended. I went, over to Amazon afterwards and gave it a bad review. <laughs> um, all right, so the interesting thing is there's one, the one innovation of Postgres really that's significant over top of uh, more traditional relational databases like Oracle uh, or SQL Server is that you can have inheritance. So which they hadn't, they had never, they hadn't figured that out, I guess, from reading the book and from using the system for two weeks that uh, actually, if you're going to do this in Postgres, you can just create a news table that inherits from a content table, and uh, it will, in fact, inherit all its columns. I think under the hood, probably what Postgres is doing is creating a helper table and doing a join, since uh, you know, it already has presumably efficient mechanisms for doing that. All right, so that was one. Those were a couple issues. They picked the wrong names, and they weren't using the mechanism of uh, the database that was there for doing this kind of data model. But the deeper issue is that uh, if you have two content types that differ in, say, 30 columns, then it probably does make sense to have two. Uh, you don't want to have you know, a thousand column content table, and then for most content items have almost everything be null, except for a few things. However, Comment and article really only differed in the value of one column. And the comment you'd have, you know, a refers to pointing to some kind of article in the articles. But so basically that meant that a comment on an article and an article were only essentially differing in the value of one column. So an article could just as well be a comment with a null refers to column, at which point it really doesn't make sense to uh, have these two tables at all, uh, and you can unify them into uh, you know some kind of single table. All right, so what about B-board? Um, an answer clearly refers to a question. So can we unify that into uh, one table? So can B-board essentially just be a kind of uh, content? And then maybe if you already have some way on photo.net, as you saw, there's a whole bunch of different B-board topics. So there's medium format, there's nature photography. The question is, uh, if you have also for, say, articles or items of content, some parent, <laughs> um, could the parent be your B-board topic? So the parent ID tells you which of the major topics it's all about. And then the... Uh, uh, like I said, a null refers to tells you it's a question at top level, and a refers to refers to tells you it's underneath. So I think that might work pretty well. The problem that you get into okay, so here's basically um, so you have nature photography. And then you have a question, and then you have an answer, answer, answer. Okay, so how expensive is it to um, query out all of the uh, questions? How difficult is it to find the questions in nature photography? Well, we're only. 
if we're just showing the questions. The number of questions. What's that? Be a function of the number of questions. Okay. Well, what's your query look like? Select star from from table where where field equals question. Well, okay. What do we say indicated a question? Where, where what is null? Yeah, parent ID should be nature and refers to as null. Because if refers to had something, then it would be a B board? Then it would, would, that the idea, or it would be an answer. It would be an answer okay. if it were referring to. So we're not mixing in our other content types yet in the same table. We're still keeping them separate. Uh, even if, okay, that's a good question. So what do you guys think th about that? Does this does this preclude us from having um, all the content types mixed in one table? Also say and where type is is, is B board. Do we have to say that? What stops you know some random article from showing up here? None of them will parent to nature. <laughs> yeah, I think none of them will parent to nature. Okay, so. That could be an expensive query because you could have to, you say that it's proportional number of questions, but it sounds like to me that um, it's going to scan every item of content in the content table. So how can you get rid of that problem? By what? Okay. So what do you guys think of that strategy? Index by nature, index by null. I'm not sure what index by null means. So what kind of index indices do you create? You, you, you index on the field. Okay. So you, you can create indices by column in a relational database management system. Um, so... I guess for this one, you can index by parent ID. Uh, it turns out that indexing, it turns out that in most database management systems, I can't speak for all of them, um, the, uh, the standard B-tree index will not help you retrieve null uh, values. So basically, there's no, the uh, columns that have uh, a value of null are, are simply the rows where that particular column has the value null, it's simply not in the index at all. So to do those, it has to scan. Um, so that's a pretty nasty little problem. On photo.net, usually what you see is we're querying out in the Q&A forum the most recent questions that are null. So we've indexed it by topic, which has the same property as the parent ID. And then we've um, also indexed it by date, so we're scanning through the most recently contributed postings. We are we are having to uh, have it. Well, we have Oracle throw away the uh, ones where the um, refers to is null, and that gives us the most recent questions. But it's doing more work than you might think because of the fact that null values aren't stored in the index anywhere. I guess there's a reason why they're not in there, which is that you know Oracle thinks to itself, well. Suppose half the columns in the database, I mean, null really means this isn't being used. So we have no information about this. Yeah, they don't want to build an index where, um, where that wouldn't be very selective, right? Because at that, at that point, it'd have to be doing a sequential scan on some index block. It's not, not the end of the world if your database has to do a little more work. It's just something you ought to be aware of. All right. So um, what if we're displaying a single question? How much work do we have to do? Let's talk about strategies for displaying a question and all the answers. Let's talk about a query that would return it. <coughs> Sure, why not? 
Okay, we'll start off with a select. That seems safe enough. <laughs> I don't think you mean parent ID, do you? Okay. So presumably we already know that, you know, at this point we're going to know the question number, mm -hmm. right, because somebody will have clicked on it, so that will be encoded in the URL request. So we're looking for, you know, question number, actually that's question number four, but we'll fix that. Okay. So we're referring to question number three. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay, is that all we need? Is that going to give us the rows back in the right order? Because having to sort them in your procedural language is pretty lame. Uh, let's call it creation date. I think that pretty much does the job. So, um, how fast is this query going to be? Or what do you need to do to make it fast? Index on Index first. Um, yeah, I guess that's all you need in this case, since that's the only thing in your where clause. Okay, so if you were to index this by refers to, you get pretty good selectivity. There's not going to be that many things referring to something else. Okay. So is everybody happy with that? Does that give us the question content or just the answers? Like we would like to have the question content followed by all the. Well, you could you could do a second query up at the top. Get the question out. To get the question out, I don't think that's big that big a deal. Having to do two two queries on a page isn't going to ruin you. Having to do some number of queries on the page that relates to the number of answers, though, you know, might get into um, some serious problems. All right. So what about, um, what about if we want to show all the questions and answers on one page in kind of a nested format? So how hard is that going to be? Do you believe that? What does it look like? Exactly. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact, and you know we can get there. You wrote something like this already. Okay. All right. So, um, let's see. It's like select distinct, uh, the name of the, the uh, question itself. Uh, well, actually, we're just grabbing all of those, right? Yeah. Can we put in any where clauses? What's an obvious where clause? Where the refers to is no. What we want to do is we're going to get a topic no. still, right? Yeah. So, okay. And then Equals, you know, whatever the token is for nature. That would have to be indexed to not be terrible, right? Um, yeah, I guess so. Let's not worry about indices for the moment, though. Let's see if we can even express this idea. Okay. Um, then what? Grouping is generally a bad idea for something like this, I think, because what grouping is doing is taking a bunch of rows and smashing them together into your final report. So I just have a feeling that that's not going to work here. I haven't thought this query out, by the way, myself. We're, we're so I'm same without, position you are. <laughs> without looping in our procedural language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're well, seeing if we can do it in the SQL query. I think it's possible, actually. I don't. We want the rows to come out in order of query answer, 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 question, answer, answer, question, answer. Yeah, we need the rows to come out for sure in the uh, order that we're going to display them on the page. Um, if we have to do some procedural logic on the page, 
to figure out how to present them, how to indent them, that's okay. So it's quite possible that, you know, we'll uh, have to do some work on each row to figure out where it, you know, where it goes, but we shouldn't have to do any work in terms of reordering them. Okay, so we've... Okay. Order by creation date. It has to be a, another select to get the, to get all the answers. Right? Okay, so that's one that's one way to do it. Um, well, although we we said we were going to disallow that, but that certainly shows the potential inefficiency of this. You have to have two database connections open at the same time. You have to be looping through a cursor that would give you all the questions. And then each time you got a question back, you would go and do a subquery of uh, that form over here. You say cursor, are you, thinking, are you, are you talking within the database there would be a way to do that with the cursor? Or um, well, if you were in the database in PL SQL, yeah, that's essentially what you'd be doing. Um, any database programmer would refer to, if you, if you if you're in the middle of a select reading row at a time, they would say that's a cursor, whether you're in a C program or a Perl program or Visual Basic or whatever. So, and that's just the database. The databases don't really care about procedural language. They are giving you this cursor, and letting you loop through it. They're not, they're never giving you back the entire result, because you might have specified a query that. You know, could return 10 million rows, and they're pretty sure that you don't want all 10 million. So it's not that the Oracle C library is going to grab all 10 million and then give it to you. They're giving you a pointer into, they're giving you a cursor, which points into this row set. Okay, so that's beginning to expose the terrible inefficiency of this kind of system uh, if what we want to do is show everything on one page. Um, can anybody think of a way to do it without? What's usually your alternative? Actually, here's a good question. In your experience, um, let's say we have a program that is um, doing a query, and then for every row that comes back, going and do some, doing some other query. So a query loop, and then inside the loop, a subquery. Um, what does that almost always mean that you're not doing, that you should be doing? What can you change about your SQL that would get let, let, you, let you do that in one step? Running as a function. So. Running a function on the database server. That's true, although you know, databases when the relational database survived for 15 years before being tarted up with uh, procedural languages internally. No, I'm saying you're doing a query, and then as each row comes back, for each row, you're doing another query. Right? This is a very, if you look at beginning database programmers, this is a very common style of coding. If you look at experienced database programmers, this is uh, a once in a lifetime structure. Questions and the answers are contained in the same table, right? Yeah, although that's sort of irrelevant to this. Sure. I, I'll give you an example. You could look through. Let's say you had. Let's say you wanted to print out all your users' addresses, mm -hmm. and you had a users table and an address table. The beginning SQL programmer would uh, query all the users, and then for each user ID that came back, would query the user address table to grab a row, print that out, oh. grab another row. Okay, so joins. That does seem like a good idea, but what do we join this table to? Okay, so I think I have a feeling that we can make this work. 
So we say that C1 parent ID is equal to nature. This is going to get pretty horrific. Um, we order by C1 creation date. And we select, I don't know, C, well, let's not even worry about the select list. Let's just try to get the correct rows back. Okay, C1 dot content ID equals C2 dot refers to. Okay, that's not looking so bad. Actually, that might be all that we need. Is that all that we need? Well, we want order by, it'll order it by what we, what we tell it to order. That's the beauty of computers. One creation date, comma, C2, comma, creation date. Can you do that? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this does impose, I didn't say that your procedural code wouldn't be a little bit messy. I just said it wouldn't look like this. In this case, your procedural code is going to have to do the unpleasant thing of watching, say, for C1 content ID and storing it up from the last loop and seeing when it changes in order to figure out, okay, now we've switched to a new question. Maybe we put in a you know, headline or a break or something in between questions. So the procedural code still has to look at the what's coming back from the database, but is getting back from the database Question all the answers. Question. question all the answers. Question all the answers. You know, in the order, it's getting back some extra crud. Notice that if we do this style, we're pro probably going to we're going to be pulling the um, subject line and the body of the question through with every answer as well. So we're we're sort of getting double the amount of traffic over the what an Oracle would be called SQL net over the connection between the database client and the database server. But you know, nobody ever said that they made their IT infrastructure more zippy by installing a SQL database. It was uh, you're making it more abstract, and abstraction always costs you performance. But anyway, this is what you would see if you do. If any time you do something like this, you're generally making uh, some code that uh, is going to make a SQL programmer throw up. How many times are you calling the database in this case? So on photo.net, there's 135,000 questions. Actually, there's, not there's probably yeah, 50,000 questions or so. So yeah, this is calling the database 50,000 times instead of uh, once. OK. Um, well, this is not how ACS works. In ACS 3.4, anyway, you can do all this with one query, no joins. Um, and in fact, this gets even nastier. Let's say that we allow answers to answers to answers. I'm not 100% convinced of this fact, but I have a feeling that however many levels of answers we have, in order to get everything out in threaded order, we would have to just have that many levels of joins. And so we'd have this huge explosion in the amount of work the database is working. Because remember, without appropriate indices, um, the relational database is going to have to create the Cartesian, the full Cartesian product of the row set and then throw out the rows that don't meet the where constraints. In this case, I guess, um, you know, there's certainly going to be an index on content ID. Um, we already decided that we, we want an index on refers to. So this might be a pretty f efficient join, but I'm sure that after, I don't know, eventually something like Postgres would certainly give up and start producing enormous row sets and grinding away pig slow. And even if it didn't, internally it would be kind of doing, right, under the hood, presumably the database is doing some kind of sub loops of various kinds. Uh, so how does last class of I'm not sure how slash dot works, but I suspect that it works the same way as uh, ACS to some extent. So basically, 
Um, ordering string or something yeah, one thing, that, one thing to observe here is that there's no law that says you have to do all your work at query time. And when you consider that a question is inserted, one, an answer is inserted once and queried mem many times, that's a good reason to look for a way to do some extra work when you insert and then make it easier to uh, query. So in photo.net, particularly for that threaded view, we said, all right, we want to create some kind of sort key that will let us just query the table once, order by that sort key, and have everything print out in uh, sorted order. OK, so what if we say um, this is a uh, question, uh, I don't know, let's call it 3. And this is answer, you know, 3.1. And this is answer 3.1.1. Three dot two, three dot two dot one, three dot two dot one dot one. Have we succeeded here? We have? Okay. If, mm. if you're I know the problem. The problem is that we will eventually lose because eventually this will be three dot one one. But we're almost on track, right? Basically, we have almost one. If we just order by the sort key, we get three first, then we do get 3.1. Um, actually, maybe we don't we don't win because it's not clear where period. Right. What are we using to sort? <coughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So actually, that's a good point. Um, if you limited yourself, you could like, multiply questions times a thousand, and Answers times 100 and sub times. Right. Okay, so that's a good idea. I think also, I bet you could tuck them in. I bet you could always, there's always space inside the world of floating point numbers pretty much, right? So you could right. kind of tuck them in. This is not how we did it on photo.net. How we did it on photo.net is described in a book chapter of my old book. Chapter 13. It's on philip.greenspun.com slash WTR slash dead dash trees. Um, and if you go down to example, four, case four, the bulletin board, um, we have this message ID, a refers to and a sort key. It's probably a little more machinery than we absolutely need. And we start the message ID generator off at uh, all zeros. So we try to come up with something that will sort lexicographically just using character sorting. So basically, the message IDs look like this, you know, 0002Z. We put all the leading zeros out front because otherwise you get into a situation where, you know, 13 sorts ahead of 9, because 1 is smaller than 9, right? So basically, if you pad everything with zeros, then you'll actually get the sorting behavior that you want. It turns out the ASCII representation of numbers is um, uh, in ascending order. So in other words, a 0 is an ASCII, uh, I forget. 49 or 48 or something, and a 1 is one more, and it goes up like that. So you can do this. And we've created, in order for compactness, we use um, integers, capital letters, lowercase letters. So which is, again, the way, they're, the way that uh, these, these characters occur in uh, ASCII. So that gives us, at each position, the possibility of having about um, 62 I think, yeah, 62 possibilities. <laughs> Haven't thought about this for a while. Okay, um, now in practice, this probably should be done in SQL or PL SQL or Java or something inside the database. I was generating these things 
in uh, Tickle. So you do a select for update, which will um, I guess this this wasn't using Oracle, but anyway, you you'd be able to do a Right. You do a uh, select for update last message ID for message ID generator. And then um, compute what the new thing should be based on the old thing. So, you know, from 00002A, you'd have to go up to 00002B and then write that back into the table and then use that for your new inserted message. Okay. So then, for messages that respond to the top level, there's two extra characters bolted on. So we go from 00, zero all the way up to uh, dot zero .0z and then dot to one to dot one dot zero, and then eventually I guess we get to dot zz, lowercase zz. So at that point we have um, the possibility of 4,000 responses to uh, each message. CNN actually was playing around with ACS for their community stuff at one point, and they had to extend this to have four characters uh, at each response level. Because we, we, we uh, this actually does show a certain amount of brain damage. We kind of expected that people would want threading, and so we built something for heavily threaded discussions. Whereas, you know, it turns out that the style for UI, at least, seems to be more um, non-threaded. So even with 50,000 responses, they don't bother doing any threading. Uh, okay, so uh, a response to a response has a sort key with four characters. And so remember, this is what I was telling you about. You can query the database, and you'll get the rows back in the correct order, but you will have to do some work in your procedural language to figure out where to present something. So in this case, we can query, order by the sort key, and we'll get everything else, everything in the correct order, just by Oracle ordering lexicographically by ordering strings. Um, but we will have to uh, measure the length of the sort key in our procedural language. In this case, like I said, it was tickle. And then figure out, OK, we're going to indent it uh, a number of spaces proportional to the length of the sort key after the period. So if there's nothing after the period, it's a top level question. If there's two characters, it's, you know, let's, I, I think actually, I think we indent it two, two spaces times the number of things in the sort key. So if there's uh, if it's a response, it gets pushed four characters in. I could be wrong. Let's have a look. This is a One, two, three. <laughs> Looks like four, yeah. So two times the uh, length of the sort key after the. So there's a side effect. Period. You have a lot more answers to answers than you can have just answers. As a side effect. Because they're four digits, is that right, or is it you leave the first two zeros? Here. Um, you can have a lot more questions. Let's go back to that. Sorry. Okay, you can have a lot more questions than you can have answers right. to an individual question, right? There's. Uh, 62 to the sixth possible questions, and then the first level of answers have two digits. Right, so that gives you only 4,000 possibilities. And then your, your second level of answers also has two digits. Okay. So, so any any answer can itself have 4,000 answers. Any of those can have 4,000 answers. Okay. And how do they only have two digits because the first two are set to the answer that they're responding to, or they're just zeros? Well. They only have two digits because that's what we decided was the space for first level answers. And we decided that the next two would be reserved for telling you. Um, but if we'd, um, we could have made it longer, right? We could have said that, uh, actually, there is a limit. There is a limit. We could have said there's four positions for each answer, which, like I said, we did uh, see that in the CNN case when they adopted ACS. They uh, change to four per. Um, to a hard limit, though. Basically, Nicole can only index something that's 700 
438 characters long. There's some weird limit. So you can create a bar chart that's 4,000 long. You can create a C log that's 4 gigabytes long. But if you want to build a B-tree index, there's an arbitrary limit, and it's around 700 characters. And if you want to do a compound index, like topic, comma, sort, key, um, then it, it's uh, even shorter, right? The, the character length relates, um, I don't know, integers probably slide in there at something like 20, uh, 20 bytes. So if you want to index a number, comma, the sort key, comma, something else, basically all of that has to be counted in this budget. I think it's 738 in Oracle 8. I forget. That kind of sticks in my mind. So one reason we kept it to two is because that let us have more levels of threading before we ran into that Oracle limit. But obviously the CNN guys don't care. They're never going to allow threading. They just want it to be deeper. So by computing this at insertion time, and it's a pretty easy thing to compute, I forget if I have the source code. No, I don't. But basically, uh, let's suppose you're responding to this question. Um, all you have to do in responding to that is query the database for the maximum sort key where the sort key is like this one. So basically, that'll hit the index as well. It'll start looking in the index for that kind of sort key. And then it'll keep chugging up until it finds uh, the maximum one, at which point um, you, uh, increment. you increment that one by one. So right, if you ask for the maximum, let's say there's already six responses, the maximum sort key that looks like this actually we do like we do this one and then we do two more underscores. There's a SQL. It's a not, it's not there's a there's a SQL wildcard for an individual character. So in other words, instead of saying this sort key percent, which would say anything that starts with this sort key, we say this sort key and then two more slots. So that gets us only ones that are exactly one level down, and we get the maximum sort key, and then we increment that in the procedural language with using our weird. Um, you know, numbering scheme that uses letters as numbers. And then we insert a new message uh, with that sort key. So this has the advantage. I mean, why didn't we just use floating, some kind of weird floating point number system? I think this looks pretty hard to read on a first glance. But actually, I figured that um, when I designed this that, you know, something went wrong with my system. It's never the complicated things that you think. That the things that are complicated never actually go wrong. So I've implemented software to do, I don't know, surface modeling through a bunch of points and um, continuous surface modeling through those points and just all this really complicated software with computational geometry, algorithms, line simulation, and it almost always just works. And then, you know, you get really simple software that has horrible bugs. Um, so anyway, this is sort of one of the more complicated system, and it's certainly the one that's caused the least amount of trouble. But I thought, OK, well, if anything ever gets screwed up, at least I'll be able to read this with my eyes and see you know, for an individual message exactly how deep it is, you know, what it's supposed to be referring to. So I think it is kind of nice if the data in your database uh, is human readable, um, particularly if you're using something like Postgres, which is potentially flaky, and you may get a corrupted database. So that's an idea. And that gets us out of this bind. That's essentially doing this with the bugs fixed. You know, with, OK, our periods now become positional. And uh, we don't get into the 11 versus 1 uh, versus, say, 2 problem, where 11 is uh, less than 2 for lexicographic sorting reasons, because we've padded everything into a fixed number of positions. So that's kind of a cool little system, eh? Hey, Where, where's Dimitri? Canadian. Um, OK. For the purpose of you know this class, I think most of you will be pretty well served by just implementing Q&A forms, unless you have some good reason not to. I wanted you to see the issues when you go for full threading. Um, there could be a way to 
<coughs> give an option to respond to an answer that right that would start a new question and automatically copy over the text or something. Yeah. I don't know. You could do that from a link that would that would automatically sort of link back to the question you're referring to. Um yeah, you you could build that if you wanted to. Although, you know, again, the stuff is pretty easy to program. Um, it's a lot easier to program things like this than to explain them to users. So the photo.net thing is kind of carefully crafted. We've kind of found our way into this because it's the thing that resulted in people not sending us email saying how how do I use the forum? So, you know, there's been probably little bug buglets in the UI that have been fixed over the years. We kind of screwed ourselves I think, you know, with the attachments. So I think that the way that we ask people on the confirm page to attach something could use a lot of work. But the users, I guess, are sophisticated enough that they get through it, or the ones who are really unsophisticated never confirm and they don't post at all. I'm not sure what happens. But I think that, you know, we have the confirm box is separated from what you're confirming by this sort of you know, file upload crud. So I'm not real happy with that, but I have been too lazy to fix it myself. Like most things. <laughs> no questions? You, you could extend this into a um, hierarchy of parentage, like a Dewey Decimal System. Could you extend this into a hierarchy of parentage? That's a good question. Uh, on Photodyne, we didn't bother. The topic... Um, is not reflected in the sort key. So you're querying, you know, topic, com you know, querying for one specific topic and then doing the sorting. Actually, now that we have that unified form, I'm not sure what Louise did to make that work. Actually, it's not a big deal because in that unified form, we're only trying to present the top level questions. So we can probably do, um, you know, we're, we're just looking for things where we're querying by date where it refers to as null. So a single index on the B board table, as long as all the messages are stored in one table, which they are, and as long as they're indexed by date, we're again scanning through all the recently contributed postings and the database is just throwing out the ones that uh, are answers rather than questions. So that's a reasonably efficient query. Uh, it's also looking at the user's set list of, or, or the publisher's depending, set list of preferences as to which forms uh, he or she wants to see. So if, if you can't index on, or if it doesn't do any good to index on things where the values are null. Where you're going to query for you're values. Query for nullness. Yeah. Well, could you collapse the, the concept of parentage and refers to and just have your questions sort of refer to some low integer that you specify as your topic and then you could just query. Yeah. that's And it might even be cleaner, you know, to have the topics to give the topics what you would call first-class status as messages. I mean, anytime you can eliminate data types, you're probably simplifying your life. So having a B-board topic be a separate thing from a B-board question sounds like a good idea. But in programming, and from a user's point of view, it is a good idea. Uh, to reflect that through into the data model might have been a mistake on my part. And it certainly would, yeah, it would yield to, you could get it, like, the, the unif right? We could do a unified forum with threading, with everything with just one sort key. Now, I'm not sure on photo.net how many people want to look at a million messages all on one page, uh, but some might. And some might want to look at today's action all on one page. And on photo.net, that, that would be a pretty expensive query. But, you know, we're talking about a factor of 10 here, maybe, in terms of the amount of work, or 100. We haven't totally screwed ourselves. Whereas to do the threaded stuff without a sort key, you know, you're potentially getting into millions of times more work as you Join, 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 join. When you do returns 10 answers and there's a more link in the bottom, you go to the next page. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Is that reflected is it, in the query and is it, it does a new query? Is it redoing all that work? Yeah. In general, that, the, so that's a good question. Um, what about all these sites where it gives you the first, like Google, where it gives you the first 20 and then you go back and you get the next 20, and then you go back and get the next 20. Is it redoing the query each time? Some kind of only return 10 in the SQL? Well, and then return the next, I don't Yeah, okay, so there's a, that's a, so there's a bunch of issues there. Uh, so the good systems, 
that are really designed for this uh, kind of web presentation, like Google, I believe that you're getting connected back up with the same machine and it's finding your query again and it's just giving you the next 20. It's somehow stored information there about you know what it's already shown you or you know what the result set is. Uh, relational databases, particularly when you deal with the issue of load balancers that might bounce you over to a different physical machine, very, very hard from a programming point of view, it's very hard to cache query results um, in your server and then deliver them back out without just doing the same query again. Uh, if you think about it, if you have a single, say, AOL server or IIS process, and that's serving all of your requests, you do have some logical places to keep it in memory um, and then serve it back again. But it still has some issues like uh, you know, when you flush that cache, right? you don't want to keep it around for a year in the hopes that the user will come back. So what we used to do is restart. We had a whole bunch of things like that. We still do in ACS, actually. And we just say that by convention, you really should uh, kill your web server once a day. Like restart it at midnight so that you flush that and you know, so it doesn't just keep growing to gigabytes. Um, to your second question, what features are there in databases? I can't speak to other databases too much. Oracle has this thing called RONUM, which is a so-called pseudo column. So as you're querying uh, a table back, you get you know row num one, two, three, four, five. So what you would think you would do is say, okay, the user's requesting the third page of the result. So I'm going to look for row, let's say we're 20 at a time. So you say, let's look for um, 41 or to 60. Okay, where row num equals 41 to 60. That works great unless you use an order by. So Oracle says, oh yeah, it doesn't work. This row num is generated during some earlier stage of query processing, and then if you do an order by, it it scrambles all the row nums into some random order. So it turns out this row num column is useless for most purposes. It's useful for doing things like eliminating dupes. You can, it's, it makes it easier to construct some weird queries. Uh, it has its uses. I'm not sure that I can tell you what they are. Uh, it certainly doesn't work for this. Okay, so there's another Oracle trope, as it were, um, which is that you do your query and you put parens around it. Now it's a view. It doesn't have a name, but it actually is a view. Then you put another select and it has the order by in it. Then you do another select from that view. So you say select star from open paren select star, where row num between those two things. So basically, Oracle's doing this thing, and then the row num is getting reassigned for that outer query. It's a very strange thing. It doesn't work in most, uh, I don't think it, I doubt that it would work in Postgres. This is, again, one of the things that, there's very strange stuff, and there's very few examples. And your outer query exists purely to renumber the row nums into something reasonable, where row num equals five. So for example, if you just want the fifth row of this thing, this is an efficient way to do it. God knows what Oracle's doing under the hood, but at least from your point of view, you're not having to pull out four, and then you know, you're not having to do it in your procedural language, which would be really lame. Did you say that's efficient or inefficient? God, I said God knows. That's the whole point of SQL. Um, but at least you're not. If, if, it's, if it is inefficient, the inefficiency isn't happening on your watch, so to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I suspect it's extremely inefficient, actually, unless your table is indexed by whatever you're ordering by, because it, it would have to scan the entire table, do the order, and pull it out. Now, of course, you know, in your some of these cases, you're more likely doing an intermediate text query, which uh, you know doesn't, which would never for full text index, which would never do a full table scan and order by. It's always going to be some kind of index thing. Uh, the other thing, the newer Oracle versions have something called row number. They're only available in certain sort of data warehousing type contexts, but there actually is a way now with the newer Oracle systems, in some cases, to use row number, which is a post ordering thing, but it doesn't seem to work just where you think it would. I could be wrong, but I think it doesn't. 
just work in a vanilla little query. It only works if you've got some kind of data warehousing functions being used and extra group buys and so forth. So this nested query system might work. I don't know if anybody, has anybody tried this? Postgres might have a pseudo column. Anybody know something like this? Try it out. But yeah, it's considered, basically a good rule is that if you're pulling, although we violated it in some of these cases. Uh, no, no, we didn't. I'm sorry. We didn't violate it in the first two. Um, a good general rule is if you're pulling any data from the database and not displaying it on the page that you're making some kind of mistake. That's always a bad thing. The SQL is a very powerful query language. It is definitely powerful enough to limit the results to just what you want to show and to drag that over the network. You know, generally, your web server and your database server will be different physical machines. To drag that over the network is uh, you know, a horrible, horrible lack, reveals a horrible lack of taste. <laughs> When the user jumps from one page to the next, there might be a fence post condition where they actually miss the something got reordered in the time when they press next, so they never see an item. Oh yeah. Uh, unless you really store all your information, in which case it's out of date by definition. Yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know what to do about that. I don't like pages like that anyway. I don't like UIs like that. I think that you should show everything on one page, and if the user doesn't like them, let them hit the stop button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Sometimes the pages on photo, the photo, the pages on photo.net. If it's a really long thread, it is way longer. And I'm sure you know professional web publishers would say this really sucks. You should never see this question in so many answers. You should have to go to a second or a third page to see the rest of the answers. But I just don't believe in that. It's more UI. You know, if, if, they, if they can learn how to scroll, they can use photo.net. Whereas on the New York Times, this is one of my pet peeves. The other issue is if, they're, if there's really their techniques are very table heavy, they, it would load the entire page before it displayed anything. Right. right. And so they would need to split it up into separate pages. But if you just use regular, you know. Okay, so let's see if this works. Damn it. I think I showed you one of these ones, didn't I? Yeah. 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 So basically, I think the New York Times is almost impossible to use because they refuse to adhere to the, um, you know, all the users should know how to, have to learn how to do is scroll, maybe hitting the space bar or using the scroll bar. But it doesn't seem to be... the administration pages where, you know, here are my users, you could have 40,000. Right. Well, you can get, you know, we make it hard to get to that. Um, but why not? If that's what you need, sometimes that's what you need. Maybe you need to all, all print it out so you can copy them into a spreadsheet or a Word document. I mean, why should you have to go through 26 clicks, one for each letter, if that's what you want? I mean, if, if, you, if you're going to look at all the users or if you're going to look at all the answers, you're going to have to get those data onto your machine eventually. So you might as well get it over with. <laughs> and especially, like I said, with, some, with something like Netscape, and if you have a complicated, if you have complicated HTML and a huge page, it'll probably crash the Netscape browser. But at least with MSIE or Opera or something, you probably can print it all out. Or the Emacs browser. <laughs> all right, I guess.